Hello, this is Morale Bernard with the continuation of the story, Power of the Mind, All in the Mind. And uh, by the way, please subscribe to the channel, please. And please share the videos. Last words were, it might be a good idea to plan on the move right away. I still don't like the idea, stated Mel flatly. I'd like to think it over for a couple of days. Think it over all you want, said Nell with a grin. He walked to the calculator and patted it near the jolter. Only don't forget I don't have to ask you. He waited, almost hopefully, but Nell said nothing. Content with the feeling of power and knowledge that so long as he was prepared, the other could do nothing immediate to harm him. The time had come for action, however. Mel kept mental contact with his partner after he had left. Neil went directly to the office and unlocked the centre drawer of his desk. He then began pulling out papers and scanning them rapidly, placing some back and keeping others out. Mel gasped to himself when he saw the bank statement and the amount of money deposited under the name of the partnership. That, in Neil's personal account, was large, but it was perfectly obvious. According to dates, Mel could see through the other's eyes that the transfer of funds had not been underway for long. As it now stood, they were both practically millionaires, but he knew Neil wouldn't be satisfied. Watching through the other's eyes, Mel had his vision switch from the desk to the door. He saw that Jenkins had just entered, mouth moving. He thought he could read his lips just enough to make out his own name. Jenkins appeared to stop and listen to Neil. Then his facial expression changed as his lips protested over something. Mel's vision then switched to another desk drawer that had been opened and he saw his missing revolver nesting in it. Neil withdrew it and pointed it at Jenkins. The assistant stepped back, hands up as if to ward off a blow. Then the placating, if anxious, smile spread over his face and his mouth worked rapidly, too much so for Mel to read any words. Whatever had been said, it appeared to satisfy Neil, since he lowered the revolver. Mel broke contact and came back to his own room, and stationary video scanners that served as his eyes. Jenkins came in, and his manner made it plain to Mel that he was labouring under an intense pressure. He began puttering around the work table, gradually making his way closer to the tank house in Mel's brain. Jenkins, said Mel, purposefully extra loud. The assistant jumped nervously, dropping a piece of metal he had picked up. Yes, he almost quavered. Have you ever thought how it would be to be condemned to a life like mine? No, no, not especially. Why should I? Well, you helped put me here, you know. I was only following orders. I, all right, all right. I know how Neil can force a person to do something. But you could help me, you know. How's that? Suspiciously. I'm not going to tell anyone if that's what you're driving at. No, no. I'm not trying to get you to do that. All I want is the fuse replaced on the cart. Then it would feel as if I were moving around and break up the monotony. This is worse than any solitary cell in prison could ever be. No, refused the assistant flatly. It wouldn't do you any good anyway. It's just... He stopped hand going to his mouth as if he had said something he wasn't supposed to. How's that, Jenkins, reminded Mel as as gently as he could. What's 
supposed to happen? I don't know, replied Jenkins sullenly. Put a fuse back in the cart, directed Mel. At the same time, he applied pressure almost to the breaking point to gain the other's mind. No. He knifed through to the other's brain with ease and just enough power to accomplish his purpose without harming Jenkins. This was the most complete control Mel had ever attempted and Jenkins' legs moved spasmodically as though he were a puppet on strings. There was horror in his bulging eyes and sweat began breaking out in his forehead. Relentlessly, he was forced towards the cart until at last it had been reached. Jenkins, said Mel, as low as he could, Can you hear me? A slight twitch of the head was the only indication that he could. So Mel instructed. There's a spare fuse near the holder, Jenkins. Take it out and place it in the primary circuit. Do that and I'll let you go. If need be, I could kill you now. The fuse, Jenkins. He relaxed his hold slightly, but Jenkins made no attempt to comply. Mel continued. Remember the dead mouth, Jenkins? I did that. The fuse before I lose my patience. He applied more power until the other's hand began moving unsteadily towards the cart. As he withdrew slightly from mental contact, Jenkins continued his task and in a moment Mel was able to move the cart. He had momentarily forgotten Jenkins until he became aware that the assistant had let out a yell of terror and was rushing for the door. Mel watched with amusement, knowing that he could have stopped the other with hardly a strain. Just before he reached the door, it opened and Neil appeared. Jenkins came to a halt and stared in terror at his employer. Well, said the other impatiently, what's been keeping you, Jenkins, did you? No, he didn't, answered Mel. At the same time, he caused the cart to move sideways and swung the video scanner until it was star staring directly at Neil. Well, said the latter accusingly, switching his gaze to the terrified Jenkins. So this is how you follow out orders. He made me do it, boss. He made me babble Jenkins at Neil, face set with determination, drew his revolver from a pocket. Before the astounded Mel could do more than gaze incredulously, there were two sharp cracks, and Jenkins slowly placed his arms around his stomach and rocked back and forth in agony before toppling over to the floor to lie motionless. Now you, said Neil, swinging his revolver towards Mel's tank. Mel frantically stabbed at his partner's mind but could feel no pressure. Another shot rang out and he felt a numbing pressure seemingly from every direction that could only mean it was against his physical brain itself. The shock forced him to use every bit of power he possessed to keep conscious. Neil had lowered the revolver a trifle and was saying in a superior tone, Whatever you did to Jenkins, it only hastened the inevitable. If that makes you feel any better, I'd have had to get rid of him too once you were disposed of. He began raising the revolver again, and the dazed Mel instinctively relayed power to the cart. The eye had been pointing directly at Neil, and the only sound that indicated the energy gun had been set off was a slight hiss. The effect on Neil was not only instantaneous, but horrible to see. 
His body appeared to swell until he looked bloated, then disintegrated. Mel felt himself becoming weak and hastily brought the cart over to examine the damage the one shot had done to him. Almost fearfully, he scanned himself and saw with relief that the shot had penetrated the tank and was letting the life-giving liquid escape onto the floor. A quick glance into the tank showed that the lead pellet had missed his brain, but the pressure on the liquid had caused him the initial pain. He directed the cart over to the workbench and brought back a tapered piece of wood. The arm placed it in the hole and then applied pressure until the trickle had stopped. It would do until he could effect a permanent patch. He began to feel stronger almost immediately and knew that the automatic features of his metal body were renewing the liquid at top speed. Using the cart, he first checked the supply of chemicals, fed as needed into the tank and saw that there was a sufficient quantity to last him for at least a month. He thanked the good fortune that had allowed Jenkins to put the cart into operation before it was too late. Without it, his end would have been as certain as if Neil had been successful in killing him. His first task was to construct several more carts, each complete with video scanner. One of them was larger than the other. Its first task was to dispose of the two prettifying bodies. Working almost 24 hours a day, he hooked an intercommunication system to every room of the underground lab and directly into his system. Even the telephone was connected to it so that, if necessary, he could answer it or make a call. The day finally arrived, when there was no more he could do. The entire lab was almost like a steel and concrete body, so thoroughly had its every function been integrated as part of his brain. The decision he had been almost frantically avoiding could no longer be put aside. He had approximately a week in which to decide. It would be simple to call the police and in turn let them notify the various scientists as to his position. He dreaded the thought of the circus that the lab would become. Erzweiler, friends would droop in to look at him with morbid curiosity. Then when his potential became known, tasks would be assigned. There was a definite possibility that he would be moved even at the danger of injuring to himself. Countless thousand would demand it and their will would be obeyed unless the curtain of national security could be drawn across him. One day was spent in contacting the animals outside the lab and revelling in flight for a while. Then he sped through the countryside, first with a coyote, then with a deer. There was a possibility that if the scientists moved him, his new tank would be shielded so that it would be impossible to enjoy himself as he now was, all in the name of science, of course. On the other hand, if it were possible to have all supplies delivered to a nearby point where he could pick them up, he could continue his present method of existence. His mind jumped eagerly from problem to problem, which he could undoubtedly solve for the benefit of mankind. The present patterns and the partnership's name would bring enough money indefinitely to pursue them, since much could be done by pure thought. There was the survival face first. He would devise an electronic blanketing ray that would dampen all atomic explosions. Then he could turn to the health of people all over the world, wipe out diseases. All this would depend, of course, on his being able to remain undisturbed, and that might tax his powers to their utmost. 
he wondered if it would be worth the effort. Finally, he had less than three days left, which narrowed the safety margin to the lowest point he cared to think about. He opened the telephone circuit and heard the operator say, Number, please. He hesitated briefly then said, The wearing chemical supply house, please. His order was soon placed and afterwards he felt almost as free and elated as when, as a boy, school had let out for the summer. The manual dexterity of the metallic fingers he had constructed would enable him to write checks with his own signature. A faint idea had even tickled his curiosity and he felt certain that he could grow cells within a couple of weeks. From there, he could work on a body for himself, one even more efficient than the old one Neil had destroyed. A human in the lab at that moment would have been startled. As near possible as it was for any wheeled vehicle to do so, he had several carts almost doing a jig in the main office. His new life had just begun. The wonders of the mind. The power of the mind. Oh, do... Do uh, subscribe to Study Coach. Do surprise subscribe to the channel. And um, I'll see you soon for more stories. Morel saying bye-bye for now.